Hello and welcome to another edition of Frontline. I am Obiora Ilo. Last week we started a conversation with the former governor of Anambra State, Senator Chris Ngige. In that conversation, he told us about his travails as governor of Anambra State, how he was taken to a shrine, how he was going to be poisoned on the day he was supposed to be inaugurated as governor of Anambra State. Well, one of our viewers sent us a message on Facebook and said that the story was like an Hollywood movie, except that it truly really happened in Nigeria. Even before my swearing in, the plot to get me out has started. And it started by, they are going to the president and asking him to ask the party chairman to change the nomination. After INEC had closed the nomination, they were not satisfied and they were not uh, reassured. So they say we should go to shrine. What was your first reaction? Of course I said no. Of course I said no. It was a battle that we reached on for nearly a week. Two battles reached on for nearly a week. That one and the question of giving them a, a, a check. Put the check. check for some quantum of money. After the handover, the deputy governor didn't come for his own handover with the deputy governor, ch uh, Chief uh, Chinedu Emeka. It was when we had finished, I was trying to go out that he came and sat down for a while. We finished with him. I asked him, have you finished with the deputy governor? And he said, no. But that Chief Chris wants us to meet before we come to the convention ground. Uh, for the swearing in ground at LS Equipment Square. And I said, for what? He said that he wants three of us to meet before mom and dad will should come together. I said, okay, fine. I don't, but I don't want, because I don't want to be seen as not uh, cooperating. So when we came out from the uh, government house, our convoy was leading, the commission of police was there, the director, general, the director of SSS in the state was there, and so many other persons. Instead of branching into the Puyme Square, we went to the guest house at Udoka Estates. That was where I was to be kidnapped, kidnapped and drugged. The injection was ready. Was to put, and put me to sleep. I would sleep for maybe three days. Well, today we are serving you the second part of that conversation with Dr. Chris Ngige. Today, he tells us the story of his kidnap and how Anambra State infrastructure was destroyed. He also tells us the story of, on his inauguration day, meeting just one road in Anambra State. Just sit back and let's watch this interview, which I can rightly confirm, is like a Nollywood movie. So you you became governor, and yes. I'm wondering, yes, is this kind of very hostile environment capable mm. to be governor? Was well, it easy for you to be governor? How? Knowing that you had all these enemies, you had all these um, plots, including... One you know some of the plots, I didn't know their full details. As at then? As at then. Hidato. So, but I knew something was wrong. I knew the climb wasn't very good. So did they appoint the commissioners? Oh, they came back for the commissioners. And as a matter of fact, I discussed uh, with uh, Chris Oba, and I told him I was waiting for the list so that I can send it to the House of Assembly. 
and uh, we spoke uh, we spoke we spoke on the 6th I came back from Abuja on the 7th and from the airport I went to his house and he told me that the list wasn't ready then on the but that day I met the AIG there Rafael Ige. It was with him. They were charming, and um, I had known him too. So he was a, a common friend to us. I then left uh, for Oka. That was on the eighth. Then uh, Christopher called me up on the eighth that same night and said he was going to send me the list of commissioners on the 9th. So on the 9th, he didn't bring the list. And I called him up. He said he was going to come to Oka tomorrow, 10th, and give it to me. So on that 10th, I didn't see him. He said he was going to come and meet me in the hotel. I was staying in a hotel uh, at Oka called Choice Hotel because uh, I had to move into the government house. But one thing, uh, raised my suspicion, you know, the index of suspicion, my antenna stood up. I saw the deputy chairman of party who was acting as the chairman of the party then because we had a problem with uh, the substantive chairman who decided to follow the governor. And he came to me, to my hotel room, and said that he wanted uh, a commissionership position. I said, why? But you're acting chairman. He said, no, that he wants, and that, uh, he, needs, that he needs an executive position. I said, fine. A local government is one of the local governments that will get commissionership. Because I told uh, Chief Uba that I don't want my local government to get, because I'm already governor. And we had this position to go around uh, the other 20 local governments. Those who don't get commissionership will give them a special advisor. So he now told me that he has just finished discussing this with Chief Chris Uba in his guest house. And he's now coming from the guest house to inform me. I said, ah, is he in Oka now already? He said, yes. I said, ah, but he told me he was going to come to Oka around 11 a.m. And this thing I was telling you was about 8 a.m. So I kept quiet and uh, prepared for work. And I went to office when I waited uh, up to 9 o'clock to know whether he was going to come 9.30. Because I was calling his phone, I couldn't get. So I got to my office. And uh, the drama started after about 30 minutes. So about 10.30 uh, in the morning. AIG Rafael Ige, you know, sauntered in into my office. And of course, they pushed out my ADC on the road into my office. He was wearing a civilian dress. Uh, my ADC didn't recognize him in the civilian dress, and uh, that was it. And before I knew it... This was on the 10th of July? 10th July. 10th of July. 10.30 a.m. Not that you out of the office? No. Well, he ordered uh, the ADC out, and uh, the SSS detail also, they ordered them out and disarmed them. And uh, I didn't know, but they just came in and sat down. And uh, I said, hey, is it OK? This early morning visit. What happened? He said, no, they, that uh, is OK. That is only you who is not OK. I said, how? He said, you are not OK because you are no longer governor. I said, how? So when he said that, uh, I got down from my table 
and came down to sit near him. And I said, how? He said, because uh, I have orders for you not to live here. I said, that's from who? He said, from above. Because I looked at my television, it was still on. And showing NTA programs, and I said, there was no coup. There was no coup. So I said, I, I don't understand though. So I, I offered him something to drink. He said, no, he doesn't want anything. That uh, if he wants, he will take. And he went to the refrigerator there and took water. I put it by his side. And I said, what is happening in the country? You say that I can't live here. And he said, yes. So I went back to my table, actually, because I had some files to treat. And I started treating the, uh, one or two files. And after a time, I touched my phone to call my secretary. And he said, no, I shouldn't call. Then my ADC walked in and ordered him out. Then I knew there was trouble. So after a while, my phone rang and I took it up. He said, he said I should drop. But it was my intercom. I told him now it was my intercom because they removed telephone access to my office. It was uh, night air cable lines and things like that. So my secretary said, when I told him it was my secretary, he now said, okay, if he's your secretary and later come, you can talk. Us. My secretary said, the director of SSS had called her. That she should tell me he's been trying to reach me. That his boy said that there is an AIG in the office who uh, disarmed them. Whether the person is a real AIG or not. I said, tell him that I don't know, that he's a real AIG, that he's AIG in charge of uh, the zone, and that I know him. So when he had me mention AIG, he said, oh, God, drop that phone. Drop that phone. Was, so he, was, he, was he pulling a gun? Well, uh, uh, he was smelling alcohol. He wouldn't know whether there's a pistol, and pulling a gun is anything that can happen at any time. So you dropped the phone? Of course I dropped the phone. It's the living general who will live to tell the tale of what happened. If they shoot at you as a general and you're dead, the living Lance Corporal is better than you to tell stories of what happened. So, so what happened next? What happened next was that um, I sat there and uh, checked. I ruminated on what to do. I didn't know what to do, so I had to beg him that I needed my secretary to get certain files for me. So when he permitted me to talk to the secretary on the phone, on the, phone the secretary said to me that the director said that I called back again and that coincidentally he's on the other line. And I said, okay, if he's on the other line, put him on speakerphone and bring it to the intercom. So he did that. And I spoke to the man. I told him what was up. Yes, but I had to speak co codedly. Mm. I had to speak in a coded way. And uh, he then knew that there was uh, real trouble. And um, my secretary now started a Latin people calling, because I, I told him my own line has gone off. So that was it. And um, as I sat there, he also sat there, the AIG, waiting. And there was a man at the door to prevent other people from coming. And he was pointing his AK-47 rifle on my table, on me at the table. You know? And uh, I remember on another occasion, the, the intercom rang. And I tried to pick it up. It was my secretary. And that one billowed. The AIG had gone outside to look around or something and come in. That one billowed. Oh, guy, if you pick that phone again, you are dead. So I sat like that from about uh, 11 o'clock till about uh, 
quarter to three. It was at that time that the door opened and I saw the clerk of the House of Assembly. He was my teacher at uh, St. John's Secondary School along uh, in my secondary school days. So I met him again as a civil servant and of course I show him that respect as such. So he came in, his face was big, bloated. And immediately he came, the AIG jumped up and said, okay, is the paper ready? He said, yes. He took the paper. Invariably they were beating him. Sorry? They may have beaten him. I don't know, but uh, he came from the house. I think Puffy, maybe because, maybe he was crying. I don't know. Was with red eye and everything. He's like a family to, a member to me. So I think that was what has happened to him. So he took the paper? So uh, the man took the paper and served me one and took one. So I read. It was a resolution of the House of Assembly. Accepting, accepting my resignation and asking uh, for the deputy governor to be sworn in in conformity with section uh, 181 or so, where governor resigns or dies or incapacitated. So when I read it, as a matter of fact, it, uh, it, it made me angry. I was very polite and very civil with the man, but when I read this, I discovered why he was there. And I felt that uh, he had breached his oath of office. So after reading it, I asked him point blank. I didn't fear death, I didn't fear gone. I said, is that why you're here? And before he could answer, I said, would you walk out from here? I ordered him out. And I told him I was still the governor of this state. If this paper is why you're here, I am still the governor of this state. And you must take instructions from me, uh, the chief security officer of this state. Get out from my office. And that was it. And he left? No, he, he was st staggered and confused too. So I started packing my bags, my files, and put them in my bag. And I said, okay, if that's why you're here, you want to take this office, take it. I'm going. He said, no, you should come back. Come and hand over to me. I said, hand, who are you? Why should I hand over to you? Policeman. So I carried my bag by myself. Put it on my shoulder. I started going out. And he sat there looking at me. After a while, he started following me. And I came out. The one with AK-47 was uh, trying to blood you. I said, my friend, get out from here. I'm going home. You said I'm not governor, so go and take the governor's office. So I walked out. And when I came, they had uh, folded the flag of state and flag of uh, everything on my official car. And I called up my private forces. That forces I used in going forward, swearing in. It comes to me every time. So I tried to enter there. They started blocking me. So then I noticed that all the staff in the government house we are locked in in their offices because they were peeping out from the windows to see what was, see what was happening. They locked them in in their various offices. So when I started shouting at that compound and telling the man off, the workers started uh, shouting too and uh, calling them names. And the, the police had surrounded the whole of the government house, including the gates. So the AIG said I should not leave, that he has instruction to take me to my village. Of course, I got angry again. I shouted at him. I said, who told you I want to go to my village? If I've ceased to be governor, as you claim, I'm a free man. I can go anywhere I want. I want to go to Lagos. My family is in Lagos. Of course, uh, at that time, he had become weak in uh, his assertions. But he said he would put uh, an oddly to take me to wherever I'm going. And so put uh, one um, DSP, three star. Yeah. And then I was at the back, and then my driver, my personal driver, 
It wasn't even on government uh, payroll. Where were your orders? Oh, they have all disappeared. They have all disappeared. You know, police is like a uh, uh, dog. They obey to the last command. You, you might have 20 of them. You don't see them on, on just one instruction. So they all go from my, my ADC to my CSO to my everybody. And unfortunately, my CSO was also police. So on the way, I told uh, the... It was just you and this... Yes, with yes. a heavy truck filled yeah. with Mumbai policemen yeah. following us. And of course, those who surrounded the government house were still there. They're taking positions there. Then on the way, I told my driver to the tour to the hotel. Uh, the AIG was following us. And after a while, after we passed uh, a place called Aroma Junction in Oka, mm -hmm. he detoured to go to the State House of Assembly. At least maybe to tell them that uh, the job had been done, uh, job accomplished. And uh, we detoured and got to the hotel, Choice Hotel, and the truck followed us. When we got there, some mobile men came down and into the compound. I went to my own block because I, was, I had a floor in that hotel. The, the, the proprietor constructed a new block and it happened to have four rooms on the floor with a small hall and I w was using it as uh, my residence pending when they finished the renovation of the governor's lodge. So I got there and I wanted to go up with my PA who had, was also following and who had run into the hotel too with me. They said no, that I'm the only one who will go up with them. So I said no, I won't go up with you. My PA has to follow me to pack my things. They refused and I refused. That, that, you see that my controversy name, mm -hmm. we had a controversy there. Right there? Yeah, right there. And I said, no. And they cocked their guns. I said, well, you can shoot. But I can't go with you alone without a third party on my own side. The third party must come from my side. And this is the man. And he has to come and do the packing and bring down the, the suitcase. In any case, when they continued the argument, I, I found out that a thought flashed in my mind and I said, why are you following them? So when they finally buckled, I said, okay, he can go with you, let us all go. I said, no, I'm not going anywhere again. He said, eh? I said, yes, I'm, I'm not going anywhere again. So by that time, my staff members were coming. I saw my chief press secretary from a distance because they were all blocked from coming into the area of my own block of uh, flats. So I started gathering strength. I started seeing some faces who were not the uh, people who took me hostage. So I said I wasn't going away again. They said, why do you say you are not going again? I said, because this is the hotel where I'm domiciled. And I don't need to leave it. I want to stay here, even uh, having finished the governor. They said, but you say you were going to go to your village and we agreed with you. I said, no, it is you people who said that. So I drew a chair, a plastic chair from one end of the uh, compound there and sat down. And that was how the drama started again. It is, <laughs> it is, uh, the, the test standard of the drama. And um, <clears throat> as I sat there, I saw a traditional ruler who is my friend. We quarreled politically because uh, he went and worked for Abga in the election. So Abga took me to court. So since I won the election, or oh, I was sworn in, he doesn't talk to me, he doesn't come near me. And that was my first time of seeing him. Igwe Anuku. Of Umboku. So he walked past, even though I was his political uh, enemy. I was a personal friend still. So he walked past the first time, and uh, I saw him 
looked at us with uh, the side of his eye and then passed and then came back a second time to get a, a closer view. So on his uh, third movement on, along the corridor, over, uh, overlooking the, the courtyard where we were staying with, and arguing with these police people, he saw me and uh, he came down and from a distance spoke in Igbo, Ogini. What is going on here? I said, well, I'm here, I'm under house arrest. And uh, the people say I'm no longer governor. He did his face like this. And then, of course, a lot of people in Anambra knew there was rumbling in government and that all was not well because it was uh, about six weeks and I have not appointed commissioners. And uh, even the appointment of uh, my principal secretary was denied me. The secretary to government was appointed for me. Principal secretary was appointed for me. Uh, even my ADC was also hoisted on me. Not to talk about uh, another person that brought us uh, uh, a chief detail. Anyway, the chief came nearer and spoke to Nebo and I told him what. So he opened the courtyard and came. And of course, they ordered him out and he refused. Then my sister came too, came near the courtyard. They ordered her out, but she was on the balcony. So I went to her to speak to her. And in a nutshell, I gave her a summary of what has happened. They were attacking with the chief. I came back, and the chief, of course, had overpowered them and intimidated the police people. He's a director in Julius Beja, so he introduced himself, and uh, he was lodging the hotel there, too. So he now asked me that I should hold on. So the first person he got was Dr. Lesse Kweme, who also even though he was in, in PDP still, was not a, a very active member, having lost the party nomination to Chief Obasanjo. So he gave me the phone and said, speak to former vice president. I spoke to Kweme and I told him what had happened. He said, OK, he, that uh, uh, is there any coup or anything in that state? I said, no. So the chief uh, asked me, is there any other person you want to speak to? I said, yes. He said the number, I gave him the number. He dialed the number, it didn't go. He dialed it the second time, it didn't go. It was a land phone. And that land phone was in the PDP secretariat. It occurred to me to speak to my friend, my very good friend, A.K. Dikibo, uh, the late A.K. Dikibo. So I took the phone from him and then dialed. I'm just one dialing, I got a PDP secretary. The number was in my head because that used to be, that is the National Secretary's office and that used to be our gathering point when Dr. Modo was a National Secretary and I was a National Secretary. So a five, two, three, four number. So I just dialed it once. And, got, and lo and behold, who picked the phone was uh, Vino Bulafo the incumbent secretary at the time. And um, <clears throat> no secretary picked the phone, as is customary with that office. So when I, I spoke and uh, uh, for say who is speaking, I said, I introduced myself, I said uh, Ngige, Dr. Chris Ngige. He bellowed on the other end, my friend, stop playing jokes with this phone. We have more serious matters in our hand and we are saying you are Chief uh, Dr. Chris Singige. Please, who are you? And once he said that, I knew it was him too and that I knew he was dead serious and uh, I had just one moment to identify myself. So what I thought ran through my mind immediately. If, you are, if I, I keep on identifying myself as Chris Singige, no, no, he will never listen to me. In fact, he would bang the phone. So I called him, the, the familiar uh, P, 
pen name, uh, nickname, I call him, which is Prince. I say Prince of the Niger, that's what I call him. And once I say Prince of the Niger, he got it immediately that it was me and he shouted. His Excellency, is it you? I said, yes. Are you alive? I said, yes. He said, please, hold on. We are in a meeting of National Working Committee here. And this matter is what is bothering us. Where are you? Are you alive? I said, yes. He said, hold on. So the first person to rush to the phone was A.K. Dikibo, my friend, who said to him, are you sure, uh, Prince, what you are saying? He picked the phone and called me Ibo leader, because that's what he called me. And I said, I said uh, A.K., he said, what's happening? Where are you? Are you uh, in, in detention? Are you in prison? I said, no. So I said, it. he said, what is going on? So before I could talk, another member of the working committee has snatched the phone and like that. And Prince came back and took the phone from all of them and said that Radio Nigeria is here. Do you mind speaking to Radio Nigeria? I said, why not? So Ediro was already in the office because he sent his uh, crew to interview officers of the party on my whereabouts and nobody was talking. Nobody was ready to talk. That's it. So Ediro, I, I spoke to Radio Nigeria and I told my life. And I said, I'm alive. And I gave a summary of what has happened. And the policemen were watching you? Of course, the policemen uh, saw my demeanor. I was uh, already going to fight physically with one of them. Uh -huh. And so, and my uh, staff members have started climbing the rail and coming into the courtyard. And so they now retreated and took position at the walls. And it was then they started good getting the full import of what they had done and or what they were doing. And a, lo a lot of them retreated, including the uh, three-star GSP, who was given the assignment of uh, ferrying me to the village. And of course, as some sources said, the plan was to shoot me on the road and uh, feign that the man was running away or tried to disarm the police. And so that was what happened. So. With that call, Nigerians knew I was alive. And, and, what, uh, and what had happened. And then from there, so why all this? I called the vice president's office. I called the villa to speak to the president. Because the police people then had retreated and allowed me to continue with, to continue with my calls. So I got the villa. And uh, the switchboard boys, they know me. When I finish council meetings in the villa, I normally, on my way out, I can come in there and joke with them, you know. I know some are Yoruba, some are Osa, but I can speak Igbo to them. And we joke like that. So they saw a guy, so you are alive? I said, yes, I'm alive. They say, you want to speak to president? I say, yes. They say, he's not in. But he went to Mozambique. And uh, I said, I want to get, they said, do you want to speak to him there? I said, that's right. So they made frantic effort to connect me to president in Mozambique. I think the, the course were blocked. They were blocked off. And um, they now came back to me and said, they say Baba is in a meeting in uh, Mozambique. Do you mind speaking to the vice president? I said, is the vice president in the country? Because he had just come back and uh, went to Potako that day and came back. So I said, yes. So they connected me, and I was online with uh, Vice President Atiko Abaka. And he said, uh, Governor, they say you have resigned, that, and that you resigned on uh, family grounds. I said, I never did resign. Never. I never resigned at all. He said, ah, and what is this story they are telling here? That, uh, I said, no, I never. They put in a fake paper, fake resignation paper. Because the truth is that for whatever they were asking me to resign as at that time, that they were suspecting I won't be a lawyer, they asked me to resign as governor elect. There's no st status for anybody to resign as governor elect. 
Did you sign a document like that for them? Of course, I, I signed it and I told them to go and they put it in where they want to. And they could not accept it from you. Neither would PDP do anything with it. And under that pressure, so... That was it. That was it. And the vice president now told me that he, he, he will now order the IG of police to make sure that he and his men get me back to my office that same day. That I should continue my work. That resignation is voluntary and not by force. So around 6.30 p.m., the same AIG came with the commissioner of police and I'm AIG. Yes. With the uh, commissioner of police, uh, Gaia, and they came. Both of them came and saluted me. That was then I know that they have restored my governorship. The coup has failed. The coup has failed. <laughs> so they saluted me and I, I said to them, you are welcome. They said, sir. In the courtyard. In the courtyard. But it was a little bit dark, a little, you know, getting dark. They said, sir, we are under instruction to take you to your office. I said, no. Uh, let me go up and get ready. So they were there. They wanted to go up with me. My, my men blocked them. That is my staff. personal security. What, they turned themselves into staff. Uh, my staff turned themselves into uh, personal security. You know? And more of my town men, my local government people, my campaign organization members had trooped in at that time. So they stopped the police. They said, don't guide him. We are now the guy, they took over. So I went upstairs and then uh, I undressed. So they came up after waiting for a long while. I asked my boys to allow them to come. They came and I told them I wasn't going to the office again. So they said, what do we do? Because uh, the IG's instruction is clear that we, you must get to the office today. I said, you can get the IG. I will yeah. tell him that I'm not going to save you the trouble too. So they got the IG. After a, a long attempt, it was then getting to about 8 o'clock. And I, I told the IG that there's no point. I don't work after 6 o'clock. That's a lie, yo, because I walk in my office till 9. Mm -hmm. So I told him, and under this atmosphere, there's no way I will go there. So we rescheduled for tomorrow morning. And so by tomorrow morning, the PDP also have sent uh, their own delegation. The National Assembly has sent uh, a combined team led by Aton Zeribe. Uh, they said it's for people from Southeast. Aton Zeribe, Senator Aton Zeribe, Senator Okuru. Uh, of course, Honorable Chuman Zeribe foisted himself on the delegation and uh, one other person. So they came and it was a conjoint meeting. They met the people from PDP. No, no, no. They came first and they were the people that took me to the office with the police. So I arrived at my office around 10 o'clock in the morning. And by the time I arrived uh, at 10 in the morning, the whole of a number of people were there. And they were shouting, singing, and uh, yelling at police. Of course, the policemen disappeared from there because they had tried to lynch one or two policemen. Summarize for us mm. what your experience was outside these distractions in yeah. Amber State. Well, it, uh, the, the, the distraction uh, wasn't a real distraction for me as a person because I'm somebody who has not gotten anything easy. I've told you so many things about my life. Uh, when we were going to take a Jambi examination, my school certificate was cancelled. I would have despaired. In fact, my family members, uh, some of them suggested to me that I, I should come and do business and start trading, that everybody mustn't go to school. I know some people in my class who, were, who veered off based on that experience. They never went to school anymore. So my life has been that of uh, hard work. I believe that there is nothing good that will come my way that I will not work for. So 
I looked at Anambra State too. I said, Anambra State, my, maybe they have my kind of uh, fit. My kind of, some people call it luck. They will not get anything unless they suffer for it. So when I came there, there was virtually nothing on ground. The pressure was empty. We were owing uh, workers salary. Uh, and uh, the areas had accumulated to about uh, 11 months. Teachers, 13 months, 15 months in some places. Uh, pensioners, their own was about uh, 18 months. And uh, the general populace, you can look at them, you can see despair. And they never believed government. That was the most crucial thing. They never believed government anymore. They had no faith in government. So when, they, when I came, and I was a PDP governor, and the African people were saying they won the election, I said, Mother of fact, there was a general voters party in Anambra State at that my election in 2003. So people were a bit nonchalant. But when they heard that there was this uh, crisis in Gomez House, okay, and uh, heard also that their governor said he would not part with, money. With, the, with the patrimony of the state, and a lot of them got, got curious and started being interested in what is being said. So I decided I must enthrone a transparent government there, give merit its right of place, in a place where people are lettered and learned. Most, there's no family that don't have a graduate. Most people, there's no company you go to, you don't see an upstairs. People live well, so to say. Their income per capita better than that of the rest of most of the Nigerian people. But what was lacking was leadership, leadership, and the development of the infrastructure that has dilapidated in the place. And these infrastructures, if you lead them in order of priorities, number one, roads. Well, virtually only one good road when I assumed office. And that one good road was the expressway running into the old Inugonisha Road. That's all. You had nothing anymore. So what were your priorities? So my priority was to sit down and walk. And I'm the son of a PWD works man. Uh, so the first thing I did was to thank God for giving me the opportunity to serve these people and ask God to give me the strength, the wisdom to actually work for them. So what were the high points of your three years? The high so point was, 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 first and foremost, I decided to liquidate all debts. So I paid arrears of salaries. I cleared them. I did them in, in batches, three, three months. And by my six months in office, I cleared all. The ones of the pensioners, they were old an old scale and I had a meeting with them and I asked them that if I pay you off your old scale it's of no use to you rather I want to give you a new pension and that new pension is what was being negotiated all over the country and only one state government had agreed to pay river state government I will not negotiate with you people I will give you the one for two percent rise so by the time Rivers started paying it and Delta, I had started. I took, it, I took off first, even though my revenue wasn't the best. So I finished that with them, and the men were happy. The teachers were happy. The civil servants were happy. Then I restructured the civil service to give them training and to make them feel that the, uh, the professionals. Second thing was road infrastructure. Anambra is a small place by landmass, but like every other place in the southeast, the population density is in the neighborhood of 80 percent per kilo uh, uh, square kilometer. And 
the soil was not good. Soft, loamy soil. Prone to erosion. Therefore, roads do not last there because most of the old roads constructed by successive government of uh, uh, Mwobodo and the military, they didn't have drains, which is a sort of erosion control. So I decided to, to do erosion control roads in Anambra State. There is no place I built a road that you don't see drains by going by side by side. In fact, the drains cost more than my roads. So I brought an old map of the, uh, uh, the old Anambra State and pulled out the new Anambra, which is uh, the present Anambra State. And then the colonial roads there, I looked at all of them. So all those roads I knew. They were no longer in existence, so I recruited them immediately. And I brought three giant contractors, Renault Construction Company, RCC, Cetraco, Nigeria Limited. Uh, well, and later they were joined by Najakat. I also had the indigenous contractors. I encouraged them, Master Holdings, and uh, two other uh, indigenous in Tabao and one other one. The Intabao came at a later stage. And I faced the thing and mapped out what I call phase one of the job, to give people roads into critical towns of Newi, Onisha, and Oka. I did a tripartite arrangement to link them all up. So by the time I left, we had done about uh, 300 and uh, 80 kilometers of solid roads, oh. which are today, which are still standing today, nine years, uh, 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 seven years after. That's where the giant fit. Yes. There's yes. no doubt that um, you made a lot of impact in uh, road construction. Road yes. construction, and even in other spheres yes. of uh, education. Of, uh, of life. We did, we did too. But we unfortunately, did. Mm. three years after, yes. the court said you had gone yes. to the government house through the back door. That's what they said. But uh, it will also interest you that if you ask juries, if you ask erudite judges, if you look at that judgment, they will tell you that there are a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, landmark or what they call president, president pronouncements of superior courts of records were flouted. Was it, are you suggesting it was beyond the law? That they were political yes, undertones? they were. Because they were. I remember they that were. you had a, they were. Like a, a fight with the president. Yes, there was. The president had a hand. And the president was swearing that I rigged the election. So he said where, so many times. Where, and did you, uh, where did you part ways with the president? There was no time or, or, or reason or, or, or saying time. The time was tied to that of the Obas. Because... He loved Ubaz and Ubaz also loved him and they were serving him. So whatever they say, he will do. But you had an opportunity to talk with him. Of course, I talked with him. And after talking with me, he will go and do the opposite thing. And the final time I came, I said, <clears throat> these guys are throwing pebbles at me. And they throw pebbles at me and go and hide at your back. I am here. I'm the state governor. They ran me out of the road with their convoy, and they are not in government. They do all other things to me. Please, Mr. President, if you cannot call them to order, take this as my final visit on this matter. Because if they throw me pebbles, I will throw back. But the danger is that if I throw, because they hide at your back, it might touch you. And you say I've disrespected you. I told him. And he, when he persisted in defending them, they threw me pebbles. I threw, I threw, and some of them touched him. And I have no regrets that they touched him. No apologies. Because I told him. But let me ask you. Yeah. Chris Oba was your friend. Yes. Stop being your friend. Is your friend again. Yes. Do you think Chris Oba is a bad man? Well, Chris Oba has, uh, is an unfair question. I've already told you that I've forgiven him and I've forgiven the Obas. So you don't want because to vengeance is, is not mine. Vengeance is left for God. And 
I don't want us to go into whether he's a bad man or a good man. A man who asked me to come and be governor, a man who interfaced with other people, worked with other people, in fact stood in front to make, you to make me governor. Will you want me to say he's a bad man? If I say he's a bad man, I'm being unfair. But the man who fought me in order to remove me in a crude manner, and even talks came to the state and burned down the state and burned down the government house. I don't know how I will look at him again. So the judgment is not mine. Do you think the president, the president of Bassanjo was unfair to you? Of course. Very, very unfair to Are you friends to today? Have you, do you see him today? And I don't know whether we are friends. We mustn't be friends. I don't know. We mustn't. It does not, it's not everybody that uh, should be your friend. You know when we started, I said you were Mr. Controversy. Yes. Your best man at your wedding has a, an issue with you? Yes. The man that made you governor has yeah, an issue no, with the you? No, the man who was my best man had an issue with me. And he, he should blame himself. No, is it you? No, 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 no. Listen very carefully. When you are in this business called politics, and people are hustling for power. They do all sorts of things. So for him to have rejected the offer made to him to come and be the governorship candidate and run away and chicken away, and when he saw that the coast was clear, that then by the Jew will not use Bakasi people to kill people anymore, as he labeled him, and now he wants to unseat me through the back door. If I don't fight back, I will be a fool. I, we, I got the House of Assembly to impeach him immediately, even while the, the peace process, according to the PDP, was on. We had to do the needful. We are politicians. I have to save myself. So when the House of Assembly members came to me and said, oh, God, we want to impeach this man so that we can have a, a, a better person, I, I marked it good. When they said they want to impeach their speaker for misleading them, I might also marked it good. If this is a game where you, they, 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 you don't uh, 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 play softball. The, you don't play softball. And you don't give the other cheek, as they say in the Bible, when you are slapped, you put this other one. Otherwise, they will blind you. Okay, they recently, will kill you. Recently, you have achieved that dream of, of going to the Senate. Yes. But it's not easy. Not easy. Not easy because. Are you fulfilled? Do you. Well, yes. Today I'm fulfilled because that's my ambition to get there. But I'm not totally fulfilled because there are certain work, there are certain things I think I can do in the Senate, whether they are revolutionary or not. And I will do them. Tell me. Yeah. In one sentence. That's right. How would you describe Dr. Chris Nkike? Difficult to do. Difficult to do, just uh, Can I help you? Help me, but... Controversial? No. Stubborn? Oh, yes, you have to be stubborn when you're on the right path. Yes, you have to fight when, when fights are brought into your territory. You don't run away. I've helped you, so you give me the rest. The rest is that this is a principled man who stands on the path of justice and who believes that in a carnivorous environment like Nigeria, you don't get what is your right on, unless you fight back to get it when it has been taken away from you. And so for that reason, I'm ready to fight back for my right. I'm ready to fight back for that of my children, my brothers and sisters, my townspeople, the people of my local government, the people of Anambra State, and Nigerians in general. When would you get tired? No, 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 I won't get tired. If there's anything, we have certain people who are not tired of such things. President Obasanjo will never get tired of fighting, but in his own case, he's fighting in the wrong direction. I see why you tell my friend, will not get tired of fighting for justice. We are in the same compartment. And that was why he's my soulmate. That was why when we wanted to say no in Council of State or Economic Council to Obasanjo is only two of us that will say it eyeball to eyeball and give reasons, cogent, verifiable reasons.
So, decision. yes, for making that decision. How and we're not chicken away. If, if, um, and he fought both of us. If, if, if someday um, we want to remember you, how would you want to be remembered? Chris Mwabezengige, an Igbo patriot, a Nigerian patriot, he passed through this way. He says no to injustice. He believes in the quality of all men, egalitarianism, and will be remembered for having fought to enter injustice for all in Nigeria. I must thank you, distinguished Senator. Thank you, thank you. Well, we've been talking, talking with His Excellency, Senator Chris Mabezengige. Um, I think it's been quite a discussion, quite a story. Thanks. Thank for you. You're welcome. That was Chris Ngige, the former governor of Anambra State, telling his story. And that's our package for today. Let's do it again next Sunday on Frontline. I am Obiorilo from Abuja, Nigeria. Have a wonderful day.